Okay, hello again and welcome back. Today we're moving on to the final section of chapter 11, which is integrals of scalar fields. And so let's just recall really quick, what is a scalar field? A scalar field is going to be a function of more than one variable, two or three, most of the time in our cases, and it's going to output just one number, a scalar. So these are the sorts of uh, objects we're going to be integrating today. And uh, it's not going to be too terribly complicated, but uh, in general, I think we want to think of this as definite integrals of scalar fields um, because we'll actually be evaluating them at bounds to get some useful quantities out of these scalar fields. Okay, so let's jump back to maybe calculus one, where we would often have an integral of a function and we would integrate against the variable of that function, and then we had bounds on the integral. And the way we would uh, find the integral of a function like this is we would calculate an antiderivative and evaluate it at the endpoints. So F, capital F is an antiderivative. And then you evaluate at the endpoints and subtract one from the other. And that's, uh, that's really you know, one of our fundamental theorems of calculus, uh, basically the version for definite integrals. So we're going to be doing something similar with our scalar fields. It'll just be that we're jumping up in dimension in the sense that we'll be able to take integrals in, in multiple variables. Okay, so here's a quick tiny generalization that um, we want to get a little bit used to. And that's that uh, we can refer to just some region. The region is called omega, that's capital omega. We'll refer to a region as omega and then write f d omega means over the region. Okay, so this is this is kind of a classical use of just saying regions, um, and that way we can increase the dimension of omega. It can now be a sphere, it could be a cube, it could be a triangular prism, etc. And this becomes an unambiguous notation. Uh, but in the specific case of omega being the interval a to b, then we recover our classical one-dimensional calculus. So let's look at maybe a different region, right? So here we go, we jump up to a higher dimensional situation, and now we're gonna define our region omega as the region, it's, a, it's going to be a rectangle, and the rectangle is going to go from x0 to x1 in the x direction, and y0 to y1 in the y direction. And of course, that we, the way we could represent that mathematically is like we could say omega equals x0, x1, because there is truly an interval occurring in the x direction. And then we use the Cartesian product, which is just the, uh, the x times y0, y1. And that's how we would increase the dimension of that interval, referencing uh, the, the length in the y direction. So this is the way we would mathematically represent such an omega if we wanted to well define it in terms of two intervals which are uh, perpendicular to each other. Okay, so now we encounter our first higher dimensional integral. So if we decided to integrate over the omega above, and f is now a function of two variables, then integrating f, the function over this, this region omega, can be represented in terms of our traditional one-dimensional integrals, just as the integral in the x direction against x, and then the integral in the y direction against y. And this is why it's really useful to use the, the Cartesian product notation for omega because uh, then the product of the intervals x and y turns into truly a product of differentials here. And so we just see that all we have to do to calculate integrals over regions is basically uh, compute individual integrals in single dimensions uh, over and over again until we encounter the entire region. And you can see, uh, Maybe I should have used two integral signs for omega earlier. It's somewhat ambiguous. In mathematics, you'll notice that sometimes we use only a single integral uh, to represent integrals in higher dimensions, but it seems like the, the author wants to use two integrals to really reinforce that we are performing an integral in two dimensions. Okay, so we're jumping back to a one-dimensional integral just to refresh our memory. So let's calculate the, uh, the integral of the function x squared plus two over the bounds one to two. And of course we could represent that uh, somewhat abstractly as the integral from a to b of f. But then if we represent that much less abstractly, this is the integral from one to two of x squared plus two dx. And if we all remember our antiderivatives with respect to x here, the antiderivative of x squared will be x cubed 
or 3 plus 2x evaluated at 1 and 2 gives me 8 thirds plus 4 minus 1 third minus 2. I've distributed the minus sign there. And so it looks like I have 7 thirds plus 2, which will give me 13 thirds. So that's our generic one-dimensional integral. Let's verify in the example that they also got 13 thirds. Look at that. Uh, but now we're gonna we're gonna jump up a dimension. So let's try the two-dimensional case. And really, what we're thinking is we're just gonna do two one-dimensional integrals. One of them in the x direction. One of them in the y direction. So let's look at this example. Where now I have a scalar field, which depends on x and y, just as multiplying the two of them. And I have to introduce bounds on both x and y. Because then the double integral in both my x and y directions goes from the lower bounds on x and then the lower bounds on y. And actually the order does not matter here, so we could have swapped the order of x's and y's, but it's you know a little bit easy to just choose an order and stick with that. So we're going to take an integral in x first and then an integral in y. And so by that, what I mean is I'm just going to look right here at that integral in x and I'm going to compute that. So let's compute the integral from 1 to 2 of xy dx. Okay, now we have to be a little bit careful because when I say dx, I mean the only, this is just like partial derivatives, the only variables I'm integrating are variables in x. Every other variable will be treated like a constant. So this y right here is treated like a constant. I only care about x. And if we all remember our antiderivatives in x, that'll be x squared over 2. The y needs to sit along for the ride. It hasn't disappeared just because I was integrating x. The y sits along for a ride. I take the integral from 1 to 2. And I have to make one extra nice assumption here is that once again, in dx, the 1 here and the 2 here are referring to values of x. Okay, So we just want to remember which variables we're using in each case. And so I'm plugging a 2 in for x, I get 4 halves y, minus plugging a 1 in for x, I get 1 half y, and I end up with 3 halves y. So that means what I've written in blue down below is going to get replaced with 3 halves y, what I've just calculated. So I'm going to take that, I'm going to plug it in for what I've covered in blue, and what I'm left with is a 3 to 4 of, now the integral's been calculated, 3 halves y dy. And now we're going to calculate this integral just as we would a one-dimensional integral. So the antiderivative of 3 halves y with respect to y will be 3 halves comes along for the ride, I gain a y squared over 2 from the antiderivative of y, and now I'm evaluating at 3 to 4, where if I do that, let's jump up and give myself some more space. Evaluating at 4, I get 3 halves times 16 halves. Evaluating at 3, I get 3 halves times 9 halves and times 7 halves, or in other words, uh, 21 fourths, right? So now I want to talk about what is this value 21 fourths? How should we interpret it? Well, the 21 fourths is just like in one-dimensional calculus, our calculus one, we interpreted the definite integral of a function as the area under a curve over a given interval. We're now thinking about kind of the area, but really the region. This 21 fourths represents the region under f of x over the intervals the two intervals. So over the two intervals, uh, both the x and the y intervals, we have the region under f of x, y, and of course it's a, it's a three-dimensional region because we've computed uh, two intervals perpendicular to one another, which describe a rectangle in the x-y plane, and then, and then we've pushed that region vertically up to f of x, y. So that actually describes a volume. Um, so I'll say it represents the volume of the region. And so that's really important. We want to think about these, these uh, scalar uh, integrals of scalar fields as a volume of a region. And this jumping back to the, the wheat field analogy, right? If a scalar field describes the height of the wheat in any given wheat field, then my integral is now describing if I walk, you know, so many meters east and so many meters north, and then uh, compute the rest of that rectangle by, by then walking west and south, so I have walked through one rectangle, what is the total volume of wheat which occupies the inside of that rectangle? That's what we're computing here, right? If I decided to cut all of that wheat and compute the volume, you know, supposing that it perfectly fills the space, 
Uh, that's what we're calculating here. We're calculating the total volume occupied over some given region. But we can interpret that in many different ways and in many different fashions. Okay, so let's uh, let's scroll down and see that we verify that the 21 fourths is the right answer here. There's my three halves y. Scrolling down a little farther, there's my 21 fourths. So we did calculate that correctly. And we'll move onwards to now the three dimensional case. So, you know, there's once we've jumped up from one dimension to two, now going from two to three, we're not really uh, getting any more difficult in nature rather than taking two integrals, we're gonna take three integrals. Um, and they're just going to be taken one at a time once again. So we look at our three dimensional region. I just have to define yet one more interval in Z now. And I have my scalar field and I'm gonna compute three individual integrals there. So let's work through a nice example here. I have f of x, y, z is 2x plus 8 x, y, z plus 3. And I'm going to compute that over the given region. The region will be x from 0 to 1, y from 2 to 3, and z from 4 to 5. Let's jump over to the whiteboard. And hopefully I don't forget any of these numbers, but I can always jump back. So we're going to jump over to the whiteboard really quick. Two x plus eight x y z plus three, and then jumping back, we have x from zero to one, y from two to three, z from four to five. Okay, so now I'm going to set up my triple integral because I'm in three dimensions. I'm going to put f inside of there, being two x plus eight x y z plus three dx, dy, dz, and once again, these orders don't matter so long as I actually uh, place the bounds correctly. Okay, so I just need to remember that if I start with an x, I start with the x bounds, and so on. So my x bounds are 0 to 1, y bounds 2 to 3, z bounds 4 to 5, and I'm going to compute these in three separate steps. So let's just grab step 1 first, is an integral in x. Step 1, integral from 0 to 1 of 2x plus eight x y z plus three dx and i'm interpreting only x as the variable which needs an antiderivative here that's going to give me x squared over two plus only the x variable needs an antiderivative in eight x y z that gives me eight times x squared over two also known as x squared uh, sorry four x squared y z and then finally three x is my variables it's my antiderivative in specifically the x variables. I can evaluate this on the bounds, but recall that my bounds are specifically x bounds. And so I plug a one in for x, I get one half plus four yz plus three minus zero in for x, and I get zero everywhere else. Okay, so in other words, this is my first computed integral, definite integral in x. Notice no more x's, but I still have y's and z's. Okay, so if I substitute that integral inside the, the triple integral that I want to compute, I'm now going to replace everything in light blue with 1 half plus 4yz plus 3. Now I'm integrating with respect to y and z, and in the y direction I have a 2 to 3, the z direction a 4 to 5. Computing now the inside integral one more time. I'm computing 2 to 3, 1 half, plus 4yz, plus 3, and I only care about the y variable now. So I recover, well, 1 half is a constant, so the antiderivative of a constant means I multiply by the variable. 4yz, the y will turn into y squared over 2, so I'm going to recover 2yz, uh, 2y squared z, and I'm going to recover 3y, because that's the integral of the constant. On the bounds, y going from 2 to y going to 3, I plug a 3 in and I get 3 halves plus 2 times 9 is 18 z plus 3 times 3 is plus 9. I'm going to subtract plugging a 2 in. I get a 1. I get a minus uh, 2 times 4 z, so minus 8 z minus 6. And if I combine all of the relevant terms, uh, all of my terms in z, that would be the 18 and the 8 combined to give me 10. 10z, and the 9 minus 6 gives me 3, minus 1 gives me 2, plus 3 halves gives me 7 halves. And so everything in purple I'm finally going to replace in the integral I want to calculate. And I'm only left with now 10z minus, or sorry, plus 7 halves integrated in z from 4 to 5. 
An antiderivative in z gives me 10z squared over 2, also known as 5z squared, plus 7 halves z from 4 to 5. And if I plug 5 in, I get 5 times 25, which is 125, plus 7 halves times 5 is 35 halves, minus 5 times 16 is 80, minus 7 halves times 4 is 14. So 125 minus 80 is 45, minus 14 is 31, minus 35 halves is actually going to be 62, uh, sorry, plus 35 halves is 62 halves plus 35 halves is going to give me 97 halves. And I hope I did all of that in my head. Now we could always verify with the calculator. We'll go with 97 halves for now. That's going to be not even a volume at this point, right? Because we are computing uh, the, the so-called region under a, a curve in three dimensions, or rather a scalar field with three inputs. So the inputs themselves is a region. And then uh, adding up all of the scalars is going to give me some four-dimensional quantity that we don't really have a great uh, word for, some sort of 4D volume. But in fact, we're going to see that we can calculate uh, other quantities that don't necessarily correspond to volumes with these higher dimensional integrals. Okay, so 97 halves was my answer there. Let's jump back. I'm going to cross my fingers if I actually get the same answer that the book got. Yeah, I did not get the same answer. They got uh, 49. So I was off by the tiniest little bit. I was off by one half. Uh, 98 halves would be 49. So somewhere I lost a half where I was supposed to gain one. It looks like maybe even right from the beginning. Oh, well, tiny mistakes are something that we just have to put up with, and uh, it's important for you to see that I, I also make these mistakes. Unless the book made the mistake. I don't really know. Probably me, though. All right, let's move on from there. Uh, all of the theory was correct. Hopefully you don't get too mad at me. Okay, so what, what moves on from there is that uh, dimension that we can perhaps integrate a three-dimensional scalar field over a two-dimensional domain. That's perfectly valid because they've fixed z equal to 1, which really reduces my three-dimensional scalar field down to a two-dimensional scalar field once I've evaluated at z equals 1. But we'll move on there, onward. So it turns out we can compute line integrals with respect to scalar fields instead of, as before, we were computing line integrals with respect to vector fields. Uh, the primary difference here is that with respect to scalar fields, we will not have a dot product, no dot product. So vector fields, we're going to get a dot product. Scalar fields, we will not include a dot product. Otherwise, the overall procedure is somewhat similar. So if we look here, um, we're defining the, the integral of a, of a scalar field, f, over some curve, and in fact, we define that integral to be, now these are the bounds, the time bounds on the curve. So suppose my particle starts at time A and, and stops at time B, I'm going to integrate from time A to B, uh, and we define the integral along that curve as, of course, F evaluated on the curve, but then we have to multiply by the uh, arc length of that curve, more or less. Right? This is really the magnitude of the derivative, but you'll recall if I integrate the magnitude of the derivative, that's going to be the arc length. And that makes a lot of intuitive sense if we jump down here. What's going on on this nice picture is that, well, here's my curve in blue. right? So suppose I take, well, I guess the curve is technically in red. Um, so the curve's in red, but I'm going to compute the value of the function along that curve, and that's what's in blue. And so at each step along the curve, I'm going to compute a vertical line, and I'm going to multiply that by the distance that the curve has traveled. And with our arc length formula, the distance that the curve travels is exactly this magnitude of the derivative. So at each step, I multiply the height of the function by the distance the curve has traveled, and I'm going to add that all the way up along the curve. So this is just something to keep in mind. This is the definition of a scalar field line integral. So we've already seen the length of the curve um, as the example of one of these. It's very natural that if my scalar field was exactly equal to 1, then uh, there's really nothing that's being computed aside from the amount of distance that I've traveled, which is exactly the arc length of the curve. But now let's go to a slightly more uh, interesting example, which is the integral, line integral, of some curve over a paraboloid. Okay, so the curve we're going to grab is tt. That means we're, we're basically a straight line along the line y equals x from t equals 0 to t equals 1. And we're going to compute the line integral uh, of this paraboloid over that distance. Uh, 
So let's just recall the definition of the line integral was defined as the function evaluated on the curve and then multiplied by the magnitude of the derivative. So let's go back to a couple steps, do this in a few steps. We'll calculate the derivative of my curve, which is not too tricky here. When my curve is t, t, the derivative is 1, 1. So now we'll calculate the magnitude of the derivative. And we recover the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared, also known as square root of 2. And thirdly, we'll actually compute now this full integral, because f evaluated on gamma is just me plugging in the x-coordinate of gamma and the y-coordinate of gamma to f, and we recover is 2t squared. And so if we're going to evaluate this line integral from 0 to 1, looking at the line integral down there, from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t is 2t squared times root 2. That's the magnitude of the derivative of gamma dt. I recover, well, from 2t squared, the antiderivative there will be 2t cubed over 3 times root 2, evaluated at 0 and 1. And so I'll get 2 root uh, 2 over 3 as my final line integral solution. So that's going to be basically if I calculated the the the, uh, the value of my parabola along that line and added up all of those values, this is what I would get. So we'll scroll down, verify. There's my two root two over three. Uh, I'm going to skip this exercise from now just because you know, we have practice in class for this, uh, and then we're going to move on to volume integrals. What are we thinking here is that the divergence right with the dot product is sending me from a vector field into a scalar field so really these are scalar field integrals uh, but they're going to look like uh, uh, vector field integrals up up until the point where we take the divergence and these are called volume integrals because uh, basically we're, we're, we're going to integrate as it says here over the sources and the sinks inside of volume and adding up their contributions so if that makes sense okay so let's actually compute one of these we have our definition here as the divergence of a vector field and then uh, let's take the nice example of xyz over the region 0 1 2 3 and 4 5 so i'm going to jump over to the whiteboard for this again okay so volume integral of v which is the very nice vector field xyz over the same bounds we were at before 0 to 1 y in 2 to 3, and z in 3 to 4, uh, sorry, 4 to 5. Okay, if we recall the definition of this volume integral, it's the divergence of v dx dy dz, x is going from 0 to 1, y from 2 to 3, and z from 4 to 5. Divergence is not too tricky here because the partial derivative with respect to x of x is 1, Partial derivative of y with respect to y is 1, and partial derivative of z with respect to z is 1. So thankfully, my divergence here is 3, and so my antiderivatives are not too tricky at all. But I'm still going to go in order so that we get some practice on how to do these. So integral from 0 to 1 of 3 dx gives me 3x evaluated in x at 0 and 1 gives me 3. So I move onwards from there. Integral from 2 to 3 of 3 dy dz. 4 to 5 in z. Let's compute the integral in y. 2 to 3. 3 dy gives me 3y evaluated at 2 and 3. Gives me 9 minus 6. And so I have 3. And finally, this isn't going to be much of a surprise, dz from 4 to 5 gives me 3z from 4 to 5 gives me 15 minus 12 gives me 3. So lots of 3s on the board, but they're, become, they're, they're arising because each of these integrals had length 1, and it turns out the di divergence of my vector field was constant. Okay, jumping back. Oops. We'll jump down here. Yeah, we can see that we we get three there. Um, there's a really interesting theorem here that we won't go too much into because it's something that's just uh, it's going to take us too long to 
to uh, describe in detail for you, but it's something you could encounter in Calc 3. And that's that actually we can compute volume integrals by actually only looking at the, the way that the vector field changes uh, and being the normal along the boundary of, of omega. So uh, we can compute the total change that the, that the vector field would give us just by computing along the boundary. Uh, that's so long as V is actually smooth, but in most cases V will be smooth. Uh, in some ways, this is a higher dimensional version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's saying that the integral, at least in you know, in, in some directions, of my derivative uh, gradient is equal to uh, the 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 value that the the quantity takes on the boundary. So, um, sigma is the boundary here, and so the value that my my vector field takes along the boundary is equal to the the derivative. Okay, I think that's all I have for you today. Yep, that's all I have. I'll see you in class. Thanks.